Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. I hope you're not going to be in a food coma in a second. Um, welcome back to track one. Um, I'm going to introduce Mark Espy. He's, for the people that don't know him, he's one of the, the package and ports gods from OpenBSD, and he's going to do a talk about it. So, Mark. Thank you very much, Michelle. Oh, well, um, I'm very happy to be doing this talk. Uh, for once, I get access to an electrical outlet so I can use my phone and my computer, which is complicated here. And I'm going to talk about uh, architectural issues in Report 3. Uh, first, I wanted to address what I would call the elephant in the room. No, I'm not going to talk about package that uh, speed up uh, recently. For those of you using OpenBSD, it's going much faster. It's also an interesting topic, but uh, I had already decided I wanted to talk about something else. So, uh, architectural support in OpenBSD port 3. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that we had some very strict policy about things, uh, like uh, our chief, let's say, or leader, maybe. Uh, doesn't believe in uh, cross compilation for anything except bootstrapping systems. So I think uh, we have a very strong tendency to refuse to cross compile anything, including packages, which has advantages and which has also some drawbacks. Uh, the main advantage, obviously, is that it's uh, almost the best stress test you can find for general purpose computation. Like you have some people like uh, Alexander <laughs> who is uh, working a lot with networks and who is giving us lots of graphs for network bandwidth, but whenever you want to use a machine to do something else, uh, be it compilation or be it using uh, web clients or anything, uh, you really need it to work. And uh, when you are building packages, uh, you are stress testing the memory, the swap, the disk, uh, NFS to its breaking point and beyond, especially with respect to NFS most of the time. So it's still a good idea. I'm not going to pile crap on the other BSDs who sometimes had native compilation broken for some times, but that's an old story. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, one nice thing about having lots of different architectures is that you have variations. So this is not specific to the port 3. Some parts are not even related to ports. Uh, strict alignment is something which is fun, like uh, trying to work with the sun and discovering suddenly that NRA won't work because it does shit with its pointers and everything. Gendian uh, versus Litonian, obviously. Uh, that's mostly a headache for cross compilations these days. Uh, most issues have been fixed years ago. Character segmentness, I'm not sure this is even interesting, actually. Uh, it's just a poor choice on the part of PPC people, and uh, we have to live with it. Reverse stack, uh, that's a curiosity. Like if you are running HPP, you have to realize that the stack goes upwards and not downwards. So this means that you're mostly exempt from buffer overflows, and buffer overflows don't happen that often. So yeah, there are other issues with the architectures. Uh, stuff like um, register windows, uh, ghost guard on uh, Spark and stuff like that. Uh, and also some current stuff, like for instance, you have some architectures where, where you start stressing out the system, you run out of kernel memory, and that might be an issue. Uh, the actual biggest issue with architectures in the port 3, we are going to talk about that a bit more later, is compiler bugs, obviously. Well, obviously, for anybody who's tried to do ports, <laughs> who's tried to, to, to compile them on uh, anything that's not Intel 64 bits. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this because uh, this is a topic I've never talked about before, and there are lots of small bits and pieces that slowly came together over the years. Um, it's not finished, it's never finished anyway. Uh, there are some interesting points that might be uh, useful to know if you want to play with OpenBSD ports and might be also of use for 
uh, people working on other BSDs. Who knows, you might get some cool ideas to, to improve our stuff. Uh, so what's an architecture? Uh, architecture 101, I would say. Uh, I always get confused because I mostly work on NTL, but uh, if you have two variables on the system, Arch is the exact machine that you have, for instance, Mac PPC, and machine Arch is uh, the CPU model. Um, most of the times, uh, the packages are um, specific to a given architecture, so machine Arch, and we don't care about the specific model, except for very, very specific reasons. And the first issue that we're going to run into is that uh, there are variations on some architectures, most notably Intel, again, uh, which means that uh, if you don't set up your compiler correctly, you're going to end up with packages that won't run everywhere, and that's a big issue. Uh, for instance, you have minus m arch equal to native, uh, which you should never ever use when you are building packages, because uh, you don't know what it's going to do on anything except your computer, and usually when you build packages, it's for using them elsewhere. Uh, so the idea uh, in OpenBSD, and I guess behind most operating systems these days, is that you are going to target a given baseline, like Pentium, for instance, and uh, you're going to compile everything to work at least on that, on that specific make of your CPU, and possibly be slightly more optimized for more uh, frequent uh, iteration of the architecture, but it should run everywhere. Uh, there were some uh, exceptions in the past uh, because of performance issues, like for instance, there was something called Altivec on PPC uh, a long while ago uh, that was mostly used for multimedia ports because uh, they would be completely unusable <laughs> without those extensions, or those processors were really way too slow. Uh, over the years, we are killing architecture. Uh, at some point in the past, you could run OpenBSD on anything with uh, an Intel processor and an MMU, and that's no longer the case. I think that by now, the bear is at least at Pentium level and maybe higher. Uh, I don't really give a shit, actually. I have a somewhat modern machine, <laughs> and uh, as long as it works, I'm happy with it. And we get uh, very, very few uh, bug reports from people trying to run stuff on uh, very old machines with only uh, 8 megabytes of memory or so. Uh, so again, we are not Gen 2. We try to build stuff so that it works everywhere. Uh, it means that we have to talk to upstream, and uh, this is something really important. If you know people who are writing software, make sure that they do stuff that can be packaged, like trying to auto-detect everything on a machine and build specifically for that machine is a very bad idea. Uh, it can be occasionally useful when you want lots of performance, but make sure that at least in your configure script, so CMake stuff, uh, SM sheet or whatever, you get a way to build for, okay, I'm going to target this whole family of computers and it should work everywhere. Uh, you can do tests during uh, compilation to try to optimize, obviously. And uh, that's the specific case of usually multimedia ports that need to decode video and stuff like that, where you might want to have some code targeted to a specific architecture. And in that case, you must have a set of runtime modules that you are going to plug in uh, depending on what you discovered. And uh, again, it shouldn't be uh, half compiled into your program. It's much easier to do this uh, when you are designing the software and to retrofit it later. So if you know anybody who is trying to write multimedia code, tell them before they start, before it starts being a horrible headache and stuff that we have to, to patch for years. Uh, compilers. Uh, most people who are writing software uh, usually don't know uh, how software distribution works, especially OpenBSD. And so they try to do stuff with minus O3 or some other crazy option that only works well on some 
compilers, on some versions of the compilers, and uh, we have to patch that away. So please, as far as possible, make it possible to have C flags, CXX flags. If possible, make it through same options, like, okay, look at CMake, how you set compiler flags, how you set include flags, shit show that it is, that's, yeah. How not to design uh, configuring stuff. Uh, if you want to write the next uh, Mason, for instance, you have to make sure that this stuff is somewhat standardized and easy to replace for the people who are going to port software, right? Uh, even compilers change default, so this is uh, <laughs> something really funny. Uh, a while back, uh, people in Clang or GCC, I don't know, decided that they wanted to change uh, the name of some option and add some new stuff. And they decided that Okay, uh, we don't want to break with all systems, so uh, the options that we have deprecated, we are just going to display a warning and still accept the option, because you know, some people use to specify that, and uh, it should still work. And combine that with uh, CMake auto detection of options, and you end up with build logs of 100,000 lines of warnings, because hey, I have this option. Yeah, it works. It replied that it worked. Yeah, it told you there was a warning, but no, it didn't crash, so I'm going to use this option. Great work. Was fun. <coughs> so, uh, let's talk a bit more about ports now. Um, over the years, we have moved away mostly from tests uh, hard coded directly into MAC files uh, into meta information that describes what's going on. Uh, based on various examples, I can say that usually uh, writing tests directly, uh, saying that if I have this machine architecture, I'm going to do this, or this machine architecture, I'm going to do that, etc., is usually a very bad idea. Especially when you have some ports that don't work on some architecture or with some components that don't work on some architectures. Um, specifically, as when we try to automate stuff, uh, which is what DPB does and other components on the system, uh, if we have special cases, each special case uh, is going to take a toll. Uh, for instance, if a port vanishes somewhere, it's going to be invisible in the logs, or you're going to get one error message at some point, and if it's a port that everything depends on, suddenly half your port tree has vanished. Why is it? It's hidden behind the test. So instead, uh, we uh, have used and abused those mechanisms, only for arches and not for arches, to say, okay, this stuff, this specific stuff, won't compile on that architecture, that's not perfect, we would like it to work, but it's still okay. We're still going to get meta information for it, and ports that depend on it or are going to be able to take an informed decision based upon that. The port is still around, the meta information is still around. Uh, what do you choose? Do you use only for arches, not for arches? Uh, it's mostly a question of laziness, which is the shorter list. And sometimes also you are going to use explicitly broken because it's usually something that should work, but somehow a compiler people broke something somewhere and we have a, a bug report upstream and we hope that the guys at uh, Clang uh, or uh, yeah, mostly Clang uh, are going to be able to figure out what's going wrong and how to fix it. So we have tools, like I said. Uh, mostly this meta information is uh, fed through two tools. Uh, we have DPB, which gets a very large subset of all the meta information that's available in every port through uh, make dumb bars. Uh, DPB is supposed to be resilient to errors. If somehow you can't obtain information for a given package path, it's going to give you an error, but it's still going to be able to complete. On the other side, we also have SQL ports, which is an incredibly powerful way to 
uh, check the whole port tree for any kind of information, like uh, which port using uh, autoconf 2.50, uh, for instance, and shit like that. And uh, by contrast, uh, SQL ports will error out as soon as there is a port where there is a problem. It's actually very useful uh, because people new to the OpenBSD port tree uh, are usually going to make mistakes, like uh, say, okay, it doesn't lean to this architecture, so pff, I'm not going to decide anything, and so you end up with what's the package name, what are the dependencies, or this path doesn't exist. And we find out very quickly through SQL ports, because it's built about once every three days on uh, at least AMD64, and very frequently on other architectures, and if it breaks, it usually means that somebody fucked up. Sometimes it's also me, I sometimes break the file behind SQL ports, but not very often. Most often it's individual porters who committed something that's not actually the way it should be done. So this is an example uh, of what uh, Dunvars does. Uh, I just started it at the start of the port tree. Uh, I stopped it before the end because we have something like 10,000 ports and uh, it would be something like, I don't know, uh, 20 or 30,000 lines, something like that. So for uh, each packet path, for instance here, archivers slash arc, uh, you get all the variables that uh, actually make sense within the port tree, right? Uh, some stuff is actually written directly in the make file, and some other stuff is just default. For instance, archivers arc is a very simple port, so there is no multi-package to speak of. Uh, so you have just one single package, uh, sub-package, which is called dash, in that case. You have a disk file, the master files, that stuff that's used to obviously uh, fetch, fetch the files. Uh, fetch manually, we have maybe three or four instances left in the port tree these days, I think. Uh, something like that, stuff which has uh, an incredibly uh, stupid license, so we won't even try to, to, to grab it on ourselves, by ourselves. Uh, and then you have some other information that we are going to talk about, uh, like for instance compiler. Uh, and you also have the full package name, which is the end result. So basically, you've got a package path with options. We're going to talk about flavors and multi-packages. And for each full package path, sorry, you end up with a full package name, line 31 on this side. Okay so far? Uh, and there is a very small part which is uh, dependent on the architecture. When you do a Dunvar, uh, you're going to get package uh, architectures for uh, everything that's actually dependent on the machine you're building it on. Uh, you have a few ports here and there uh, which don't have any architectures, like for instance documentation usually, and uh, also some rather big stuff in tech life as well. Um, I talked about this last year. It's useful when you try to produce debug packages because then you know that you don't, well, that you shouldn't even try to build uh, debug packages for stuff that doesn't contain binaries. Uh, so this is a naming game. Uh, the unique full package path uh, can be parsed automatically. Uh, we have code uh, in the port tree that does that. Uh, we also have a similar piece of code in packaged, obviously. Uh, for instance, archiver slash arc or long slash python slash 3.10, uh, comma minus test, which is the uh, test sub package of uh, long python 3.10. Um, and uh, it's unique. Uh, which means that whenever you try to change options of whatever you build, normally you should end up with a new uh, full package path. That's something that's very deliberate in OpenBSD. We don't support having other options elsewhere. Uh, if you want to have official packages, if you really want to build packages with some specific options, 
you have to make them available as a favor. Um, this is more or less needed because OpenBSD is still a relatively small project with a very small number of developers. So uh, if we had many more options, uh, that would be a complete nightmare for bug reports and debugging. It's already difficult enough as it is. We can't uh, take on more. So flavors and multi-packages. Like I said, flavors, that's just options. You will see it uh, in the middle of your package name. And multi-packages, that's just a way to uh, not lose time <laughs> packaging stuff. Like you build stuff once, and you create several packages out of one bin. Uh, so how does this relate to having several architectures? Uh, in many, many, many cases, a port will uh, build uh, on a specific architecture, but somewhat crippled. Like, for instance, you will have some parts that depend on some stuff that's not available, like, uh, I don't know, Rust plugins, for instance. And uh, in that case, what we do is that we say, OK, uh, normally we are going to build the full port, but if we are on an architecture where this is not possible, we are going to pass some options to say, OK, don't build this, it will fail, that's not a good idea. And this specific part will end up in a different sub-package. So uh, the usual setup is you have multi-packages uh, where the architecture dependent part, the architecture broken part, is in a separate sub-package. And we have some glue that goes from having the full list of uh, multi-packages to stuff that will actually be built on the given architecture. It actually looks like this. I took a real port. I didn't even take the smallest one because I thought it would be more interesting to show you how this works on some big shit. Uh, yeah, it's a port from Raphael, so you can expect some headaches, as usual, because it's only working on stuff that's difficult to port. So that's OpenCV. And uh, as you can see, uh, the first line here uh, tells you that uh, the Java part is only going to build on architectures where we have uh, Java support on OpenBSD, actually. So AH64 and the 64 and all the Intel 32 bits. Uh, then you have every variable, as usual, um, for the main part and stuff that's specific to each package, just get uh, appended with uh, dash main or dash, dash java in that case. Uh, so obviously, uh, the sub-package names are going to be different, uh, completely different, because you want to be able to install OpenCV and OpenCV Java at the same time, assuming you want to install OpenCV Java, which is, yeah, I don't know, maybe some people use it. Uh, you have lots of glue. Uh, some of this glue we will probably talk about later, like compiler libcxx, for instance. Uh, the libraries that the main package depend on, the libraries that the Java sub-package depend on. Uh, choice of compiler, again, uh, forward. Multi-packages is always going to be main and Java. On every architecture, we are going to generate uh, meta information for both sub packages. Uh, you got a manual way to disable the Java part. Uh, that's a bonus for our infrastructure. Uh, when you have dependent port, dependent parts, sorry, that uh, aren't built all the time, that's also a way to say, okay, I have uh, a CPU that could build the Java part but I really don't want to, so I can avo avoid that. You can set uh, flavor equal uh, no Java, and then you won't build Java. And also, because you have the other part, because you have only for arch Java, it's also going to disappear on anything uh, that's not in that list. So after that, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. 
You get this line, which has most of the magic, uh, line 98, include bsd dot port dot h prime mk, uh, which will uh, look at all the variables defined before that, and it will uh, create build packages from uh, multi packages, and afterwards for the configure parts, what you do is you check, okay, do I actually want to build Java or not? And you get some configure differences, an extra module for Java. You choose the version as well, you get to build depends. And if you don't want Java, all you have to do is you have to tell CMake, well, all you have to do is you have to figure out which flag uh, does what in CMake, and then it's easy uh, to tell that, okay, I won't even try to build Java. And that's it. The big, big thing here is that all the glue, sorry, uh, to uh, say the Java sub package will only build on these architectures uh, is uh, declarative. You have one single include file that will do all the magic, and after that, you have a specific test which isn't really architecture dependent, it's only dependent on whether or not you want to build Java. Right? Uh, I hope that's clear so far. So, um, this specific module is a small part of uh, uh, the original uh, glue uh, for building ports. Um, how it works internally is that uh, it is included as a part of uh, the normal ports infrastructure. So what you do when you uh, include it manually is you do things in advance. It will always be run. <coughs> and like I said, yeah, it's going to set build packages, uh, stripping down multi-packages depending on pseudo firewalls and depending on av availability. Uh, depending on the architecture, and that's it, and it works. Oh. It also contains some more information, because at some point we realized that, as well, um, there is some information which isn't, um, which is difficult to encode as uh, specific architectures, because uh, you're going to have a whole set of ports that follow the same lines. So we use the opportunity, because it's a natural place to put this information, to have a small de a sm smallish database of uh, every property of every architecture on OpenBSD. Well, not every property, but most of the properties that are relevant to the port tree, actually. So uh, you have the full list of architectures that we currently support. Uh, you have architectures with uh, APM support. There are some ports that don't make any sense if you don't even have APM working. Big Indian architecture, less Indian architectures. Uh, that's usually not to decide whether or not you want to build something, but uh, to set up some specific compiler flags, in some cases. 64-bit uh, architectures, and also compilers, again, as usual. Uh, and also, we have some other languages in the ports which have their own support, like Mono, for instance, like also Camel, like Go, like Rust. And uh, instead of putting the list of supported architectures directly uh, in the specific modules, we decided to uplift it in a single location uh, because of performance issue, quite simply. We could leave a list of uh, OCaml architecture in the OCaml module, but then you would have to include the OCaml module each and every time, and that's not same. The idea of having modules is specifically uh, to be able to uh, have a somewhat smaller infrastructure. Uh, yeah, uh, this line, uh, line 37, debug info architectures, uh, that's not really true. We could have debug packages on more architectures. 
it's a deliberate choice right now. We only provide uh, debug packages for those two architectures. Uh, there are reasons to that related to uh, actually uh, killing uh, all architectures. Namely, uh, building debug packages on 32-bit architectures is usually unreasonable. You want to have debug packages for stuff that's large. So if you include debug info, it's going to be even larger when linking, and we only have four gigabytes of memory. So usually it doesn't fit. And uh, maybe we'll add some more at some point, I don't know. Uh, there's also the concern that the debug packages have to be on every mirror. So uh, it takes about as much space as a full package set, I guess, for a given architecture. I don't run the mirrors, I don't actually have the exact numbers, but debug packages tend to be rather big. Uh, some numbers. Uh, I did a quick grep in the port three. We have currently roughly uh, 10,000 MAC files and fragments. Out of these, uh, basedd.port.arch.mkey is only used 200 times. Uh, out of these, you have about half of them, uh, which are uh, really test on build packages. So we have something like 100 ports uh, in OpenBSD uh, that do have parts that do not build uh, depending on the architecture. And the rest, obviously, is using properties. It's saying, OK, uh, if I am on this kind of architecture, I'm going to add this, this uh, flag to configure or whatever. Uh, one fun thing for people not familiar with Mac is that uh, you can actually use these variables before they are defined. Like, for instance, it's perfectly OK to say that a given subpackage uh, will only be on Rust architectures, and then include the part that does define Rust architectures. Because only for Arch, dash sub will only be extended when it's needed. So by that point, you already have Rust architectures defined correctly. And then you can do your test as usual. Um, so let's go back to the main subject, which is uh, what's going on with respect to architectures and OpenBSD. Uh, I believe that one thing that we are doing right is that we manage to industrialize uh, everything, which means that uh, when things do not build, we usually know about it uh, very early. Then there's obviously the other issue of having people who care enough to fix it, but at least we got the logs, we got everything. Uh, so the time frame is that we got uh, binary package very early. Uh, it was mostly because of Theo who passed on me until uh, I folded and I decided to go binary packages only in the open BSD port three, somewhere around 2000. Uh, DPB came into existence thanks to Nikolai Sturm, who wrote something that was so horrible that I had to write it. Well, actually, he did something that worked, but it was a bit slow. You started this DPB, and you waited for an hour, and he told you, ah, there is an error, try again. So I tried to do something better. Uh, these days, we have dedicated bulk farms for most architectures. There is still the issue that our leader is very paranoid, so all those build farms are located in his basement which might be an issue with some architecture which are not uh, very sturdy. So uh, you can ask bug builders uh, how many times they have to try to talk to Theo to tell him, hey, you need to reset Spark 64-2 or something like that, because it has hung again. Uh, the fastest architecture is, I think, still MD64. Uh, I don't know how many machines we have, probably two or three, and it takes 24 hours to build the full port three. Uh, the slowest things, uh, I don't know which one this is these days, but if you look at the release, uh, usually we'll see four or five architectures 
show up on time and a few others will show up after uh, one or two weeks because it took that time that long to build to try to build everything and we have regular uh, build stats for everything uh, thanks to you Andre, because i think it's still your script that uh, creates the logs uh, and yeah this is the time where i get out of this and uh, show you the most recent build stats for some architectures. For instance, you can see that on RISC-5, uh, uh, we built uh, 8,000 uh, packages recently. PowerPC is much better, apparently, at uh, 9,700 packages. Spark 64, somewhere in the middle. R64, apparently, almost everything, well, everything built. Whoa. Yeah, IRM from time to time managed to build some stuff, but it's still a small architecture, so it doesn't build all that much. Uh, you can find all those reports, uh, as you can see, it's just a uh, mark uh, mailing list ar archive, so you just look for, uh, uh, what's the title again? Yeah, blah, 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 bug build report, and you will see uh, the, stat the status of every OpenBSD architecture. And you have the build uh, failures for anything that failed, so if you feel like fixing it and you have the right machine, you can try. Good luck. Uh, let's go back to representation again. Uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, probably. So, um, the way I see things is that MD64 is the bellwether. Um, might be a bit colloquial English. You have this thing that goes really fast, and uh, if something breaks on MD64, it's really bad for us. Because it's really close to what uh, muggles actually use. So, yeah, we have to fix things first on MD64. And then the other architectures, uh, some trivial stuff gets fixed really easily. Uh, some stuff doesn't really get fixed because one thing you have to remember is because you have a binary package doesn't mean it runs. You have to try it out and use it. Uh, if you have some stuff with graphical interface, sometimes it can stay broken for really long. Like for instance, uh, architectures with weird ambientness uh, will not talk correctly to graphics card and you will end up with uh, stuff with uh, really fun colors, for instance. And also, there are some stuff that we decided uh, just, okay, uh, we put a command there and we do not build this on that machine because, for instance, it doesn't have enough memory. Uh, I think that uh, all machine learning software, for instance, does not make any sense on 32-bit architectures anymore, for the most part. Compilers, I said I wanted to come back to this. Uh, we have an infrastructure that was really painful to create. I think it's the sixth or seventh iteration, and uh, the usual suspects helped a lot in uh, telling me that it didn't work properly. Uh, you have a variable compiler that you said to choose the best compiler for, uh, for that specific uh, port. Uh, currently in OpenBSD, we still have GCC3 for uh, M88K. Uh, we have an older GCC 4.2 because of licensing issues, and then we have a reasonably modern Clang uh, with libcxx uh, for quite a few architectures these days. And we also have a more modern GCC version and a more modern LLVM version imports. So what you do is you set compiler to the list of compilers that you prefer to use. Uh, between base GCC, base clang, GCC3, port GCC, port clang. And it will take the first compiler in that list to try to compile your port. The first compiler available in that list uh, to try to compile your port. Um, for normal ports, you do not have to set this variable, but uh, as soon as you have anything that uses a uh, recent C++, or some new C extensions, like in C20 or so, uh, you might need to switch to uh, bash clang or port clang or even port GCC and hope that it will build. Uh, the port itself won't see anything because it will try to auto-detect and call uh, CC and uh, C++. 
and we have just links under uh, the work directory of a port, which is at the start of the path, and that's it. That's fully transparent. Uh, there are also some details, like for instance, we switch the linker for uh, at least uh, until 64 bits, so you have to pass some options because LLB uh, doesn't have the default path, contrary to all big utils. Uh, other languages, yeah, uh, I'm not a fan of Go, I'm not a fan of Rust. Mostly because it means that uh, you have to build uh, lots of stuff to have them supported on architectures. And uh, the fashion people who are writing Go and Rust do not care about all stuff. So they're contributing uh, quite a lot uh, in killing uh, all machines. So I don't like that. Um, we have some small optimization in DPB, but yeah, I don't really have the time. I, I won't talk about that. It's not really important. Um, one small detail, if you really want to, to look at how things work, um, make is a really odd program because it tries to be lazy except when it is not. So early on, uh, before 2000, uh, I uh, took apart uh, the main makefile framework and reorganized it so that variables were before any targets and before any tests. And now each time we try to add to that, it's a bit complicated, especially when you try to get some parts of that big makefile and put it into a separate file, because you are going by nature to uh, mix up variable definitions and tests and targets. And if you don't do it in exactly the right order, you're almost certain you're going to break some stuff. It's much easier these days, specifically because we've got lots of tests. The fact that SQL ports and uh, DPB report on anything that goes wrong, usually if you try to make a change, you will notice it was not a very good idea. So, uh, to answer the question of uh, what's going to happen with uh, old style architectures, uh, in my opinion, language support is the really main issue by far. Uh, youngsters don't care about old stuff, and we have compilers that take more and more resources. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to support 32 bit architectures for long. I don't know if Landry is going to talk about that in his Firefox port. No, you have given up, right? Yeah. We are no longer uh, really uh, trying to compile anything big on a 32 bit architecture. It does not link, quite simply. Or it takes forever. Or it takes forever and it breaks. Uh, I've tried to mitigate the problem slightly. Uh, you get a DPB annotation you can put into a makefile, which is called Lonesome which is very specific. It's a, a lucky look, I'm a poor lonesome cobalt, right? Uh, it means that when you are trying to build this port, you won't try to schedule anything else on the same machine. So give uh, stuff like Firefox a fighting chance at trying to link on a poor machine that doesn't have enough memory and is going to go swapping. But uh, in the end, I think that we have to choose uh, specifically, we can still work on lots of architectures, but they have to be somewhat recent ones. Stuff that has enough memory is probably still going to be supported for at least five or ten years, I hope. But 32-bit architectures really for mainstream Unix systems, I'm pretty sure that ship has sailed. We should have maybe uh, spoken very loudly against big languages and stuff that doesn't fit on small machines, but it was five or ten years ago. We can't do anything more now. Okay, sorry, it's a bit depressing, but yeah, still we've got lots of packages building on, on, on almost everything these days, and natively. That's it, guys. Questions? No questions? Really? Oh.
Oh, yay. In package source, what we are doing for a lot of um, some of the older and less popular architectures where, for example, a port of LLVM is not available is we have a secondary version of packages like librsvg, which has a Rust dependency, and we're um, still shipping an older version that was still written in C for these specific architectures. So there's kind of a seamless fallback um, but in, in general, this, this stuff is not easy to maintain, and there's a lot of problems with this. Um, as far as drifting from what Upstream is doing, and yeah, I'm wondering what your take is on this, and how you, you're approaching these big dependencies that are being rewritten in Rust or other programming languages that um, are not as portable as C. Yeah, uh, so as far as uh, LibreSVG goes, we, I think we still have the old one as well, and we run into the same issue. Uh, one big problem is how many people you're going to have that actually use this, and uh, which means that how many tests are you going to get? Like if something breaks, uh, when are you going to notice? Is there actually somebody that uses this first? And also, uh, it means that you have a, a big variation of some software, and sooner or later, upstream is going to uh, make things completely uh, end of life. I don't know if you still have any version of, any supported version of Firefox that does actually work with the old Libras VG, or whether you need lots of patches for that to happen. I don't think we're currently patching lots of software to work with the librsvg. It's more an issue of um, the dependency chain. Um, the librsvg, the old version, has some diff slightly different requirements to the modern version, and build systems need to be aware of that. Um, we are shipping um, an old version of Firefox for these architectures, as well as um, what's What's, what we're increasingly using is um, a fork of Firefox called Arctic Fox, which is specifically targeted um, to support as many CPU architectures as possible. And the yeah. upstream offer is very BSD friendly, so I'd recommend um, hmm. so, so looking the, at Arctic Fox. Yeah, so the big question in the end is, uh, is this old version of Firefox still receiving security updates? It's getting lots of security patches backported to it um, from right. the current version. But there's some parts that are being rewritten entirely, like the CSS library that won't get any patches in the future. This is the issue, usually. You need to have uh, lots of work put into getting that working. So assuming you've got a limited uh, workforce, you have to choose the battles. The battles. Uh, I can talk again about something that's really dear to me, which is that uh, we have another browser in our port suite, which isn't really open source, which is called Chromium, because it looks like open source, but Google doesn't accept any patches from uh, irrelevant operating systems like us. Right now, the port suite of OpenBSD, and I guess that FreeBSD has got the same uh, code base now, uh, we get something like 900 patches for Chromium. And we tried upstreaming it in the past, and basically Google has told us to go for ourselves. So this is something that's really important if you want to make things go forward and uh, make sure that BSDs are not really dying. Uh, maybe try to publicize the fact that Google doesn't work with us, but they don't care about uh, whether things work, which is something of a paradox, because if you remember, at first, Chromium was done uh, reusing the preset model of OpenBSD. Oh, no. right. sure. um, hello. Um, is there, so you've mentioned random detection of features. And I know that the story for detecting, like in, on x86, you have the CPU ID, but 
all the other architectures, it's like, well, hopefully there's a syscall and it's slightly different on every different OS. Is there some kind of standardization on non-x86 stuff that OpenBSD uses? Uh, I'm not aware of any, but that might be a good idea. Uh, you should talk to kernel people about that. You should talk to people working on the kernel about that. Yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, I have a small comment and a question. The small comment on Rust is also that whatever speaks to the network will likely use encryption, which will likely mean that it will use the ring crate, which doesn't support all Rust architectures, but only a small subset. So this knocks out quite a lot of Rust ports. Yeah. Um, and the question I had is, I was a bit surprised about your statement that, it's, that using uh, machine arch is an extraordinarily bad idea. Was it just for selecting ports names, or package name stuff, or... Um, because we have pat uh, things in make files that uh, branch on uh, machine arch all the time. Uh, I'm not sure I, I get what, what I you didn't. mean. So you, s you had a point that said using machine arch is an extraordinarily bad idea. Yeah, you, using it directly for tests, uh, it usually makes things more complicated. If you can use the more generic property stuff for say, only for arch for a given architecture, uh, it makes for things that uh, it is easier to read. Uh, this is something that we noticed uh, along the, the life of the port 3. Each time I tried to add complicated features which relied on tests, uh, people, everybody including me, would sometimes miss something and create some ports that would work on MD64 but break horribly on something else. So as far as possible, we try to uplift uh, most tests uh, inside the infrastructure proper and keep the uh, makefile junk to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs>